Hi everybody, welcome to our spooky peninsula with lightning and thunder talks. All our talks will stream together, but we will have time for Q&A between the talks. Uh, so please join us on Discord to hang out or ask questions. If you are looking for a job or looking to hire, uh, please post a note on our job board channel. This is a new experiment in our journey for making a better virtual peninsula. Please let us know uh, how you enjoy it. On behalf of myself, Mark Rice and Mahmoud Hashemi, welcome to Spooky Peninsula. Hi, my name is Itamar Turner Traring, and I'm going to be talking about Phil, uh, Phil, a Python memory profiler, which is specifically designed for data science and scientific computing. Uh, and you can find more about what I do at pythonspeed.com. I do training and also uh, create Python-related educational products and more. So the, the problem that Phil is intended to address is high memory usage. Um, and high memory usage is actually in many ways a more difficult problem than high CPU usage. If you think about what happens when you run out of CPU, then your program will eventually complete. It takes a while, it's slow, it might take, you might end up paying more for your uh, virtual machine in the cloud, but your program will eventually finish. If, however, your program runs out of memory, your program is going to crash. Sometimes it'll just lock your computer up so badly you'll have to reboot it, or sometimes your program will just seg fault, uh, but you not enough memory means your program cannot finish. And so you can solve these sort of problems often just by adding more resources. So you can add more CPU, you can add more memory to your computer. And the, the problem here is that adding memory is actually much more expensive. Uh, CPU is cheap, memory is expensive. And just to sort of demonstrate uh, this in the real world, if you think about your computer, your computer spends much of its time idle. Uh, much of the time, your computer's CPU is running at like 1%. If you think about your memory usage, it, like a, it is quite common for like your laptop to be using 50% of its memory, three quarters of its memory. And the reason is it's just it's more expensive to get enough memory that you don't just keep hitting the limit. And so if you have too much memory usage and it's expensive to just buy more RAM, the next thing you want to do is reduce your memory usage. And it turns out there are different ways you might want to uh, think of like different domains have different issues with memory usage and therefore require different tools for measuring memory usage. So if you're running a server, let's say a web application, high memory usage is quite often due to leaks. Uh, handling a web request doesn't take that much memory. But if you have a memory leak, basically over time your memory usage is going to increase, increase, and increase, and increase, and increase, and increase, and eventually you're going to run out of memory. And so if you're trying to reduce memory usage in this sort of application, you want a tool that will help you find memory leaks so that you can fix them. However, if you're doing data processing, if you're doing some sort of scientific computing pipeline, if you're doing a data science pipeline, uh, the issue with memory usage is that you're processing data and a lot of it. And so basically you're loading some data, doing some stuff with it. And so instead of this sort of slowly growing memory usage, you get these spikes in memory usage when you like load in a chunk of data and do something that uses a lot of memory and then it drops down and then you have another spike. So it's lumpy, it's spiky. And the bottleneck here is the point in time where you're using the most memory usage, the peak, uh, the high watermark. And if you can reduce that, then your program will use less memory. And so your goal your t is to find that peak. You need a profiler that will find that peak for you. And so existing tools are not really great at this. Uh, the memory profiler, profiler, uh, sort of a generic name. It's pretty decent at finding memory leaks, but it's very annoying to use to, to find uh, peak memory usage. Uh, Trace malloc, which is actually built into Python, uh, is problematic in a different dimension where uh, if you're doing data science or scientific computing, you're using a lot of C libraries, maybe Fortran libraries, Cython, um, maybe Julia or Rust. And most of these libraries are not using Python uh, memory allocation APIs, which from which point on trace malloc can't see them at all. Like trace malloc only knows about Python's memory. Uh, and so trace malloc just won't help you find uh, memory usage with those third party libraries. 
And so this is why I've created a new profiler, uh, Phil. Uh, and so here's an example code that some example code I'm new profiling. And it's just this sort of really boring NumPy code that generate that allocates a bunch of arrays. Uh, and if you sort of manually try to read through the code, you'd be able to figure out like at what particular point in time the peak memory usages and how much memory is being used. Uh, but you know, this is a very simple example, and in a realistic program, it's just quite difficult to figure out what the peak moment in time is, let alone, let alone where all the memory usage is coming from. So if you have a program uh, and you want to profile it with Phil, um, if it's just a full program you want to run, if you, you want to profile, you can do field profile run. Uh, you're a program, you can pass command line arguments if you want, and it'll profile it for you. Uh, there's also Jupyter support, uh, which requires a couple of steps, but uh, it'll be the results will be embedded inside your Jupyter notebook, so you can actually profile code in your notebook. And then eventually you get a result, and the result is uh, an interactive graph. So you can see as I move my mouse around, you get different information, and it shows you memory usage at the peak, at the high watermark, at the moment in time when your program is using the most memory. So this example program I showed you a couple of slides ago, at peak was using about 570 megabytes of RAM. And what you're seeing here is a uh, flame graph. And so the width of the uh, line it shows you what percentage. So if it's the full screen, it's 100%. Uh, this one is about 70%. And the, the, the colors also line up with uh, what percentage of memory is using. Is using. So the redder the, 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 the cell, the more memory it's using. So you can see this is using 70% of the RAM. Um, and so it's redder than this part over here, which is using about 28% of the RAM. And what you're seeing here is effectively tracebacks of where the allocation happened. And so you can see that this particular allocation, uh, return numpy at zeros, which is in the make big array function, which was called by the main function, line 14, uh, which was called from the point where the program was started at line 16 of the script. And so this particular line of code for, with this traceback allocated 70% of the memory. Uh, you can actually double click on it and then it's actually really a traceback. And so you can see the exact set of lines of code that led to this line of code uh, that generated 70% of the RAM. Uh, and overall, you can see that this uh, particular line over here uh, allocated maybe 14% of the RAM. Um, and you can just sort of see in this graph exactly where all the memory was allocated that was uh, there at the peak moment in time at high watermark for memory usage. And once you know that, you can optimize. In this case, we can see that allocating this array of zeros and make a big array is like 70% of our RAM, so that's where we want to concentrate our optimization. And so the goals for fail are to make it uh, easy to use and understand. Um, I want to have low performance overhead, so you can use the real data. Track memory allocation by arbitrary uh, third-party extensions. So C, C++, Fortran, why you be able to profile it and integrate with the tools like Jupyter. And at the moment, it's doing pretty well, these goals. There's more to do, but um, I feel like it's quite useful as is. There's some future work I'd like to do. Uh, it supports multi-threading, but it's, doesn't, it scales really badly. Um, so I want to do better on that. I want to add multiprocessing support. Uh, that's going to take some re-architecture, but it is possible. I have some ideas for improving the UX. Uh, I, I'd like to be able to show you a diff to see how much worse or better different parts of your code are doing on memory allocation. And then I'd like to support things like DAS, where you're running your uh, program on multiple machines at the same time. If you want to find out more, you can go to pythonspeed.com slash fil, F-I-L. Uh, the code's available on GitHub, uh, and you can contact me at itamrst on Twitter. And thank you.
Hi, my name is James Abel and I'd like to present PyShip, an easy way to ship your Python desktop application to end users. Suppose you've created an awesome Python application, something like the code on the left. Then, of course, you'd like to give it to end users, something like the group on the right. Of course, this is how things might have looked pre-COVID and things are a bit different today, but you get the idea. The idea of PyShip is to be able to ship apps to end users in a straightforward and reliable way. The terms often used here are freezers and installers, so you may have heard these terms before. A PyShip is a freezer and it provides an installer. The goal of PyShip is to freeze virtually any Python application. This has been a sticky point of some freezers and that sometimes the optimizations used to freeze an application actually make it more difficult to get the frozen application to actually work. PyShip is probably the most, most useful for GUI applications but can also freeze command line applications or CLIs. Also, applications created with PyShip make no assumption of any pre-installed Python. The executable that is run looks like a native application to the operating system. In other words, an XE on Windows. In addition, PyShip supports automatic application updating, which can be done in the background. This is something fairly unique to PyShip. Currently, PyShip only supports Windows, but it is architected so that Mac OS and Linux ports can be added later. Uh, as far as the overall architecture, PyShip utilizes existing Python capabilities in order to make it more straightforward to create an application that can be frozen. The first two steps are normal Python constructs. The first is to make your application runnable as a main module, in other words with the dash M switch. The second is to package your application as a Python distribution, which at this point is probably most likely a wheel. There are existing tools to make this relatively straightforward, such as Flit or the regular setup.py. Once you have your application as a main module in a Python distribution, such as a wheel, you need to tell PyShip a couple of things. First, you need to tell it your application name. It's best to do that in the pyproject.toml file. If you're using Flit, this has been uh, already created for you. Also, you should tell PyShip if your application is a GUI or command line application in the pyproject.toml file. Once you've done that, you're ready to run PyShip. One of the main architectural features of PyShip is called the CLIP, which stands for Complete Location Independent Python. This is created by PyShip and is a directory that contains everything needed to run your application, which is a Python interpreter using the embedded version, your application installed via your distribution that we talked about before, and all of your dependencies. It also contains a launcher, which is a native executable, such as an XC for Windows, that the OS calls to run your application. PyShip also creates an installer. This is a normal Windows installer created using the NSYS utility application. PyShip can uh, also automatically upload all of this to the cloud, and currently Amazon Web Services is supported. Um, then you can reference your installer as an S3 object, just a pointer to it, and have users download it from S3. I mentioned updating before. Your application can also update itself in the background. The clip file, which is a zip of the clip directory, is versioned and also uploaded to the cloud. PyShip provides an update capability that downloads new versions, and those versions are used when your application restarts. This can be done without any user intervention since the Launcher app can restart your application as part of this process. For many applications, such as taskbar apps, this requires no end user intervention. To learn how to use PyShip, I have created a small example application. This is a small GUI app that you can clone from my Git repo listed here and try out. You can take it through all the steps I mentioned above to learn how to create an application using PyShip. I have recently released PyShip and I am looking for beta testers. PyShip is up on PyPI and ready to try out. Please try it out and give me your feedback and post issues if you find anything. You can go to PyShip.org and that will take you to the GitHub repo. Finally, I'd like to thank Thomas Clover, Glyph, and Eli for their work in this area. They've uh, helped me in the past providing guidance and various suggestions. Again, just visit PyShip.org to get started. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Sanjay Sadanti, and today I'm going to talk about strategy testing your Python code that uses Amazon S3. I normally talk about three approaches for doing this, but for today's lightning talk, I'm going to focus on just two of them. I want to start by mentioning that I think it's really, really important to test code that interacts with external systems. And I often see people skipping this. I think people do this because it's unfamiliar or intimidating to test external systems. Or I often hear the excuse that you're just testing the API. And I hope to touch on both of those um, points during this talk. So I want to introduce a really simple create, read, update, delete app for recipes that's backed by S3. It's only about 20 lines of code. It's a Python class called recipe, and each recipe has a name and instructions. The class has functionality to look up an existing recipe by its name, has a function to update the instructions for an existing recipe, for deleting a recipe from S3, and finally for calling save, which actually persists the data to S3. So this is about as simple as it gets. And let's go ahead and start writing tests for it. The first library I want to introduce is called Motto. It's a mock for Botto3. It's a pure Python library that makes it really, really easy to mock out AWS services in your unit tests. With Motto, they provide this mock S3 function. When you call that as a context manager, um, every Botto3 call that happens within that context gets sent to Motto's fake AWS account. So in this case, I, I'm basically starting with a clean slate. So I create a PyTest fixture that even creates the bucket that I'm going to use for my tests. Uh, then let's write a test for the create and get logic. So let's create a new recipe by creating a Python object and then saving it, which should persist it to S3. And then let's try fetching that recipe by its name. I want to assert that we actually get the right data back. The next thing we want to do is test uh, what happens when we try to fetch a recipe that doesn't exist. So the way I'm doing this is with this with pytest.raises syntax is that this unit test will pass if and only if the code inside it actually raises the S3 no such key exception. So here, since I'm trying to fetch the recipe for a sandwich, which doesn't exist, I expect it to raise that exception, and, and therefore the unit test passes. And finally, let's test the delete logic. So uh, let's create a recipe for nachos. And then I'm going to list the contents of the S3 bucket. And I'll assert that there is one file in that bucket and that the name of that key is called nachos. Then I'm going to call delete. And again, I'll list the contents of the bucket. And this time, I'll see that it's empty. So you'll see these are some really simple unit tests for writing S3. And overall, I think Motto does a really good job of implementing the S3 API. It's easy to install, it feels real, and it didn't require any code changes to my application. I also want to introduce a, a second library called LocalStack. LocalStack allows you to bring up an entire AWS cloud stack locally. Um, unlike Motto, it's not pure Python. So we need to run it in server mode, meaning we need to bring up the server in something like Docker. Here's my YAML file for it, which um, I will skip for brevity. With LocalStack, uh, we create the S3 fixture slightly differently. Uh, when we're creating the Botto3 client, we specify the endpoint URL, and we point it to where our local stack server is running. We Again, uh, this uh, leads us to a fake AWS account, and so I also have to create the bucket. Once this fixture is in place, I'm actually able to run the exact same tests that I used for Motto. It, it basically is a drop-in replacement. I've repeated them below for completeness, um, but, but they're the exact same. So, um, I want to talk briefly about what I learned about testing external systems. I think that it's really important to look for mocks that feel realistic. There are like dozens of S3 mocks out there, 
but both Motto and Local Stack implement the API very well and feel really realistic. And uh, I was actually able to drop them in in place of each other, which which made me know that there weren't any peculiarities of one library that were inconsistent. I also realized that this talk might seem very academic, uh, talking about some made up application, but actually testing S3 has helped me catch several bugs in my career, particularly around S3 versioning, how to properly delete versioned objects and giving me more sanity checks for the ETL process that I manage. If you're leaving this talk wondering which library to use, I, I think you really can't go wrong with either Motto or Local Stack. Both of them actually implement MOOCs for many other AWS services, not just S3. They can also both be used as servers to test code in multiple languages outside of Python. For Python projects, I think Motto is great because it's pure Python. You just pip install it and you can import it and start using it right away. On the other hand, local stack requires an extra build step, but its architecture is slightly more realistic. I think you can't go wrong with either solution, but I personally use Motto for Python projects and local stack elsewhere. So thank you so much for uh, watching this talk. Please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter with any questions, and I'd be happy to chat there.
Hello fellow Pine Insulators, I'm Colin, and tonight we are going to cover how not to crash your program by hitting the max number of open files. I'm sure every one of you has run into this problem at one point or another. My first time was when I wrote this seemingly innocuous program. I define a list, print some numbers, print the length. Yeah, there's no way that's going to work, but let's give it a go. Yep, there it is. Oh, I just noticed I screwed up the formatting. This should be down here. There we go. So I'm sure you can see why that happened. And I'm sure the same thing has happened for everyone here. You saw that error no too many files message for the first time, and you realized what you were doing wrong, and so you searched the internet for how do I raise the max file limit, and all the answers were for Linux, but you're using Windows. That's rough. Luckily, there's an easy cross-platform solution to this issue, and that is don't open thousands of files at the same time. Okay, those last 15 sentences were a bit of an exaggeration. Most of you have probably not run into this issue in practice. But it can happen accidentally, and because of this, we've all been taught that the correct way to open files is like this. So what's going on here? Well, there's this with thing, and there's some code indented beneath it. Well, what this does is guarantee that the file gets closed after the indented code finishes running, and we don't have to remember to do it. By the way, this is the actual file name of this script, and you can tell I'm not on Windows because double quote isn't a valid character in Windows file names. Okay, so what does that with thing really do? Why is it the correct way to open a file? And why does nobody actually run into the open file limit in practice, even if they don't use with? Let's tackle those questions in reverse order. Consider this program. Will this work? Or will it hit the limit of open files? Raise your hand if you think it works. Good, I see several hands. This program does work, and the reason it works is garbage collection. I won't go into the details today, but all you need to know is that Python keeps track of how many references exist to every object. If an object is assigned to a name, that's a reference. If an object is put in a list, that's a reference. A reference is just anything you can use to refer to the object. If all of the references are gone, then you no longer have any way to get to the object, so Python's garbage collector cleans it up. In this program, the name f is a local variable in the readData function. It's the only reference to the file object returned by open. So when the function returns, no reference to the file object remains, and it gets cleaned up by the garbage collector. And when I say gets cleaned up, I mean that the object's dunderdel method is called. Anybody want to guess what a file object's dunderdel method does? We can easily find out. We'll just create a file object and call dunderdel, and then have no idea what happened. <laughs> let's start over. And this time, let's grab a copy of all of the file object's attributes and their values, then we'll call dunderdel. And then we'll grab another copy of the file object's attributes and values, then iterate through those and take only the ones where the after value is different from the before value, and print that. Great, so it turns out that the file object's dunderdel method just closes the file object. So this all explains why this program doesn't run into the open file limit, while that program does. This one doesn't keep references to the file objects, so they get closed by the garbage collector. And this is why most people don't run into the open file limit in practice, even if they don't use with. As long as they don't accidentally keep references to their file objects, the garbage collector takes care of closing the files. So why do we need with at all? Well, it makes it practically impossible to do the wrong thing. And impossible to do the wrong thing is much better than unlikely to do the wrong thing. It's also less code. And there are a bunch of other useful things the with block can do. But before we start looking at examples, we need to know about what context managers really are. Context managers and with blocks go hand in hand. So what is a context manager? Well, this is an easy question to answer for yourself. Just go to your web browser, type docs.python.org slash three slash glossary dot html entirely from memory, control F for context manager, and you'll find this definition. An object which controls the environment seen in a with statement by defining dunder enter and dunder exit methods, cpep343. That definition is technically correct. If an object implements the dunder enter and dunder exit methods, then by definition it is a context manager. That's still not very useful unless you know when and how these methods are called. Also, speaking of calling methods, it's a pain to keep saying dunder enter and dunder exit. So for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to call them enter and exit, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Let's follow this link to the documentation of the with statement. The part we're interested in is this description of how the with statement is executed. 
I'll summarize. First, the expression following the with keyword is evaluated, which produces an object. Next, that object's enter and exit methods are loaded for later use. This is done so that we know up front whether the object is really a context manager. If either of the methods is missing, an error will be thrown at this point. Next, the enter method is invoked. If there was a target, that's the word after as, the return value is assigned to it. Next, the suite is executed. That's the indented block of code that we think of as inside the width. Finally, the exit method is invoked, possibly with exception information passed to it if the suite threw an exception. Also, if the suite threw an exception, then the return value of the exit method determines whether the exception is suppressed. That was fairly technical, but it all boils down to this. The with statement lets you put a context manager here and some code here, and the context manager's enter and exit methods will be automatically called here and here. This means you can do some setup and some teardown with only a single line of code, and there's no way for you to forget to do the teardown. It lets you write this instead of this. Now let's look at some other examples. Here we're running the help function, which prints text to standard out. But in this case, we don't want the text to go to standard out. Instead, we want to capture the text so we can do something else with it. So we temporarily replace sys.standardout with a string IO object. But we do it politely by saving the old value and restoring it when we're done. With a context manager, that can be rewritten like this. And this context manager already exists in the standard library, in the context lib module. Here's another example. We're acquiring a lock, doing some stuff, and releasing the lock. Here we're doing the same thing but better. Earlier, I explained context managers as encapsulations of cleanup and teardown operations, and that is how they're used most of the time. But I like to think about context managers in an even more general way. Everyone knows that functions let you factor out a block of code, giving it a descriptive name, and letting you use it in multiple places. You can think of context managers as the cooler, older siblings of functions. Instead of one block of code, context managers let you factor out two blocks of code. But it's not just any two blocks of code. They need to be related, and they need to surround some other code. So I like to think of context managers as a way to factor out code that surrounds other code. Context managers are also useful for a bunch of other things, like database connections, database transactions, patching things in unit tests, timing how long some code takes, and even running async tasks concurrently in a clean way. So now that we've seen some of the ways they can be useful, let's talk about how to write our own context managers. There are two ways to go about it. The first is to define a class with enter and exit methods, but I'm not even going to show an example of doing it that way because the second way is much better. Here's the second way. Simply import the context manager decorator from contextlib and write a regular old function. Well, regular except that it uses yield, so it's actually a generator function. The context manager decorator is able to take this generator function and turn it into a full context manager. The enter method is everything before the yield, and the exit method is everything after the yield. The yield itself represents where the code placed inside the with block will run. Right now, this context manager doesn't have any special exception handling, so if the code inside the with block throws an exception, we won't see the time get printed. If we want to fix that, we just need to remember that the yield is a stand-in for all the code in the with block. So we can just add a try finally around it, and that takes care of it. Oh, also, if the function yields a value, that value is what gets assigned to the target name here. I'll wrap up by touching on two important aspects of context managers that can cause some confusion. The first is a question of broad scope, and the question is, scope? New Python programmers sometimes assume that the with block defines a new scope, and so f is only defined here. But f is actually defined here. In Python, the only things that define scopes are modules, class definitions, and function definitions. With blocks don't change anything. All these variables are available in the whole function. This is important because it allows us to do some neat things with the object returned by the context manager. Here the context manager returns a result object, which isn't meant to be used until after the with block. At that point, the object can be used to retrieve the elapsed time in seconds. The last topic we need to touch on is global state. Sometimes you need to use a context manager to modify a piece of global state. We already saw one example of this, the redirect standard out context manager. It works by temporarily modifying sys.standardout, which is a global variable. Now let's imagine what might happen if we tried to use this in a multi-threaded program. 
If thread A were in the middle of this long operation and thread B tried to print something to standard out, thread B would see the modified sys.standardout and end up printing to the log file. But there's nothing we can do to fix it because sys.standardout is a global and we can't change that. The same issue could occur in an async program. Just replace the word thread with coroutine. So we can't fix sys.standardout being a global, but we can avoid this type of problem in our own code. Here's an example from a project I worked on recently. Log prefix is a context manager that causes every log message to be prefixed with the given string. The output looks something like this. You can see that each line logged by the code inside the with block has the prefix added to it. This is a perfect use for a context manager. It encapsulates a somewhat complex operation behind a very simple, easy to understand interface. Let's go behind the scenes on this one and see how it works. We have a global variable that holds the current prefix and a filter function that just attaches the current prefix to each log record. We call basic config to configure the log level and format, then attach our filter function to the handler that basic config created. All the context manager actually does is set and reset the current log prefix variable. It also takes care of appending the given string to any existing prefix so that uses of this context manager can be nested. Now let's address the global event in the room. Using a global like this is not safe in a multi-threaded program because the prefix set in one thread can affect log messages being logged from another thread. But unlike the earlier example, we created the global variable in this case. So we can solve this problem easily by replacing the global variable with a thread local variable. This means that each thread has an independent current log prefix, which solves the problem for multi-threaded programs. Async programs running in a single thread still have a problem. Luckily, since Python 3.7, we have a very similar solution that solves the async case too. It uses a context var, which is a new concept that was introduced to solve exactly this problem. You can think of it like an upgraded version of threading.local that also supports async programs. The way it works is that behind the scenes, async IO manages the context and always keeps the current context available in a thread local variable. This only works because async IO is fully cooperative. If you use a different async framework, it might not have this integration with context vars yet. And with that, let's move on to talking about If you're seeing this message, that means that my talk was interrupted due to a timeout. Luckily, thanks to context managers, I was able to leave this emergency message to let you know that everything is okay. Hopefully I got through enough of the material that you'll be able to start using context managers in your own code. They're really great. Bye!
We hope that you enjoyed the meetup. Remember that we are always looking for more talks. Please approach any of the organizers on Discord or submit a talk proposal through our forum. Goodbye, and we hope to see you next time.